Hi everyone, Natasha Janejo here from South Asian Heritage Month. Um, we have just had a session with author Saz Vora called Exploring Double Diaspora, Hidden Heritage in East Africa. We were due to play you video during that session and due to technical um, issues, we weren't able to play that video. So um, we're playing it now for you and hopefully everything will be fine. So in our session, um, we were talking about Saz's project and a uh, documentary that she's putting together that will be exploring um, double diaspora um, and specifically twice migrants from the East, Af from East Africa, from the South Asian community, from East Africa and then to Britain. And Saz has been talking to a lot of authors. She's been talking to a lot of people. She's gathering testimony. And the video footage that we have of you is for such people, Saz included. The first is Dr. Maya Palmer, who is author of Reading Cultural Representations of the Double Diaspora. And she is an academic from Cambridge. She was archiving all of this footage, bringing it all together. And I'll let her explain better than I can because she's extraordinary and you should hear her explain her own words. Sneha Puruit as well, author of Brit in Twice Migrant, Once British, also studied at SOAS, could not find any representations of her particular strand of, of, of personal and familial history and so has started building it herself through um, archive, through memory, through um, historical evidence and through personal testimony as well. So exciting stuff there as well. Saz also um, BBC journalist, two-time BAFTA winner, a board member of the UK Asian Film Festival and author of three books, My Heart Sings Your Song, Where Have You Come? and Made in Heaven as well. And she was our panellist today and she was extraordinary. The things that she's doing here are extraordinary and it is such an important part of how we take this history forward and understand that um, this part of the diaspora has a very unique experience with uh, migration and and um, and a very unique experience within the partition story as well. And that needs to be um, looked at and preserved uh, um, separately and perhaps not preserved separately, but looked at separately and acknowledged separately. And, and, and we need to allow for space for this as well. Um, our fourth author is poet Michael Aria, who's also co-founder of the Decolonial Podcast with myself. She's fantastic. She's written a beautiful um, memoir, um, poetry series called Half Woman, Half Grief. And her work really is around decolonization and grief work and uh, working through intergenerational trauma as well. So she'll be reading a poem that is all about processing this kind of um, grief and trauma and how it folds and reverberates through time and family as well. Right. Um, without further ado, I will, I will let us get on with playing the video, but thank you so much for joining us. And my apologies again that we weren't able to play this in the session. Um, and do check out the interview with Saz because it was wonderful. She's an incredible woman. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Widely, including my book, Reading Cultural Representations of the Double Diaspora, Britain, East Africa, Gujarat. The book and my research investigates cultural heritage and identity amongst the underrepresented double diaspora. By double diaspora, which is a term that I've coined, I mean the community that have been displaced twice from India to East Africa to Britain. Having spent nearly 10 years in academic research, I have developed a specialism in working on subjects around the South Asian diaspora but also working on projects that share research with public audiences. Whilst at the Open University, I worked on two strands of projects. First, around cultural heritages of reading, and second, the South Asian presence in Britain for over 400 years and their contributions during this extensive period. These latter projects were called Making Britain, Beyond the Frame, Indian British Connections, and at the heart of the nation, India in Britain. At the heart of the nation coincided with the 70th anniversary of independence. It celebrated unknown narratives through a stunning photographic exhibition that toured outdoor locations in Edinburgh, London and Leeds. Shifting away from well-known accounts of post-independence India and the earlier period of British Raj, the exhibition focused on the ways 
in which Britain's resident communities have, for centuries, played a crucial role in the formation of Britain. Now I lead Haditi Kick. I launched this earlier this year in 2022, and I launched it as a platform to nurture my passions. I'm particularly interested in narratives from and about the margins, in revealing and highlighting stories often obscured. Haditi Kick was awarded National Lottery Heritage Funding in May to conduct Hidden Heritages, Cambridgeshire, an intergenerational oral history project focused on diverse South Asian communities in the county. The project commemorates two 2022 anniversaries, the 50th anniversary of South Asian expulsion from Uganda and the 75th anniversary of partition. In the project, we will train young people in oral history techniques, empowering them to collect and preserve memories from their elders through audio recorded interviews on the themes of belonging, identity and migration. We hope to enhance well-being amongst our participants and connectedness amongst generations, whilst also providing skill sets to young people to enable them to explore their heritage and British history. This is British history after all. Lastly, the project will capture important stories from community members before they're lost forever. To help us in this work, we are partnering with the Museum of Cambridge, who will be hosting our training, as well as the Cambridgeshire Archives, who will be storing our oral history interviews permanently and digitally to ensure these valuable stories have a home once the project is finished. If you'd like to find out more about Haditi Kick, the project, or even myself, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We'd really love to hear from you. Hi, I'm Sneha Burhid, and I am a 35-year-old mum, learning consultant, poet, and writer. I am currently working on my book called Britain, Twice Migrant, Once British, which is due to be released by uh, Dutva Press in the winter. The book is a collection of accounts and narratives of uh, the migration journey from India to East Africa and then from East Africa to Britain. It's a crucial element of history that I do not want to be lost and I want to be readily available for my children and the following generations. I'm now going to read a very short excerpt from the book. Darshana's story. It was 1972. My father passed away that same year. I was 16 years old. I always considered that I was such a blessed child with a wonderful upbringing. I have vivid memories of our early days in Kampala, Uganda. As eldest to my five younger sisters, whilst I had a lot more responsibility, especially after my father passed away, we were a very happy and close-knit family. When Idi Amin declared the expulsion, it was worrying. We were deciding where to go. We were suddenly living in uncertainty, which was so contrasting to the preceding years of joyful memories. Our house was at the end of a row, and when curfew was imposed, military would patrol the alleyway beside it. I remember not being able to sleep in the fear of the footsteps. One memory from the start of the new regulations was when I saw a young Indian boy I knew from our road, physically taken during these patrols, never to be seen by his family again. He must have been 11 or 12. The community life was turned upside down and we lived in constant fear of what was around the corner. I was lucky. I worked at the Bank of Baroda and they told me that I could transfer to Britain or Canada upon moving. That was rare and I was very grateful for the support my colleagues gave me. So it was that Thursday evening, myself, my three sisters who were with us in Kampala and our mother departed to the airport. My youngest sister, Sunita, was only two and a half years old. We were driven to the airport by a close family friend. They wouldn't let you travel with anything like gold. They would check it all and take it all at the airport. The checks at the airport were such terrifying memories, we were frightened, frightened that they might hurt us. The film Last King of Scotland and the scene at the airport is so true to reality, they did do that. We don't know what happened to some people who were taken out of the queues along the way. 
I still have fear at the airport every time that I'm stopped or checked. It stays with you for life. Me, with my three very young sisters and my mum, we finally made it onto the plane. And I just remember that sense of relief when we were halfway to Britain. I felt like I could breathe again. Thank you so much. And I look forward to sharing more of Britain with you in the near future. Hello, my name is Saz Bora and I tell stories of British Indians who live in the diaspora. I'm often asked, where do I come from? A simple enough question, but it's complicated. My parents were born in India and left after the partition for East Africa. I'm a Gujarati, a Hindu and Indian who was born in Tanzania, part of the British East African Protectorate, like the many East African Asians who live in the UK. My family came to Coventry in the 60s and as I grew up, I searched for stories that had people like me, stories of people who didn't have any roots in one place. When Idi Amin expelled the Uganda nations 50 years ago, I began to identify with these people. I heard of successful people from Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, who had made the most of their Britishness embrace their East African heritage too. That's why we're marking the 50th anniversary of Uganda nation arrival in the UK. The following is a reading from my first book, My Heart Sings Your Song, book one of the Rena and Nikesh University series. When Nick told me he was a Ugandan refugee, I'd assumed he was like some of the people I'd met in the Monday. The family who'd been allowed their clothes and 50 pounds as they left the country they called their home. I know affluent Ugandan Asians who came to the Monday in Leicester, but Shakti Bhavan was in a totally different league. I began to interrogate Nick, his face filled with trepidation as he started to explain. When we first came to the UK, we lived in a large house in Harrow. Motaba and Baba had come in the 60s and thought they'd invest in a house. He told me his Baba was in Kenya when Idi Amin gave them notice to leave, so their exit wasn't as bad as some of the Indians. Did I tell you Jay and his family lived with us for a short time? They only had their clothes and his mum's jewellery when they arrived. I shook my head and he continued. Hi there, my name is Maya Kalaria and I am the author of Half Woman, Half Grief, which is a poetry book I wrote after my mum died when I was nine. And my dad and his family were brought up in Uganda and came to England after the expulsion in 72. And the poem I want to read today is about grief, but it's not in the book. It's another poem I wrote a few years ago about inherited grief, um, which I believe is quite an important topic for those who came over from Uganda because they must have had a lot of grief for the land that they lived in, for the people they knew, for the culture, for the weather, for many, many different things, which they may not have had the capacity and support to actually process. And some of that unprocessed grief may have been passed down to their children as well. And I certainly felt a sense of grief and sadness, which I couldn't quite place. Um, and I believe it may have been inherited grief from what my father and his family went through. So the poem I want to read today um, alludes to that, and I hope you enjoy it. There is a kind of inherited grief that we all hold within us cradled tightly in the cavity of our chest, protected by ribs and ribs of youth and unknowingness. Time and life erode us and it starts to unravel, becomes a dull ache, a mild tightness of breath, a defensiveness, a longing barely noticeable at first, but when held safely in the arms of a trusting love, we collapse. We tell the truth of us. We soften into oceans and we finally know what we held. 